Explorer Series Lecture, Atmospheric Rivers in a Changing Climate, How Rivers in the Sky Could Change with Christine Shields. My name is Dan Zietlow, and I'm an educational designer here with the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, which is a world-leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science. So that includes our climate, weather, the atmosphere, the sun, and how all these systems uh, interact together to impact society. I'm really glad y'all could be with us today to learn more about these rivers in the sky. I'm also really excited to, to be here with y'all since this is our first in-person Explorer Series event since the end of 2019. Um, and I, I'm really psyched to be kind of piloting the foundation for hybrid events going forward in, in 2023. Uh, so <laughs> please give us a little uh, leeway as we kind of figure out that this new space. For this event, you'll be able to uh, ask Christine questions following her lecture, and I'll help moderate that so that way we can uh, share time between both the in-person audience and our virtual audience. Uh, if you're in person, you can simply just raise your hand and ask your question. The room microphones will pick you up. And if you're in our virtual audience, you can use uh, ask your questions using Slido. Uh, so if you scroll down uh, the web page just a little bit from where you're seeing the live stream, you'll see the Slido window. And if you haven't already, go ahead and click the green Join Event button, and you, then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab. Christine also has a few poll questions for us. Uh, so for both of our in-person and our virtual audience, you can also respond on Slido. And so for those in person, you can use your phone or a laptop to go to slido.com and type in the code NCARMSR. And definitely be sure to add your answers because we're going to be getting to our word cloud question pretty soon. And that's, what do you think of when you hear the phrase atmospheric rivers? Uh, this lecture is also being recorded and will be available on our NCAR Explorer Series website. So with us today, we have NCAR scientist Christine Shields from NCAR's uh, Climate and Global Dynamics Lab. Uh, Christine is a project scientist with expertise in simulating Earth's past, present, and future climate with the Community Earth System Model, or CESM. She earned her Master's of Science in Meteorology from the Pennsylvania State University and has focused her research towards understanding Earth's hydrological cycle in the context of climate change, with particular emphasis on atmospheric rivers, monsoons, moisture transport, uh, cyclones, and weather extremes. Christine is also involved in a community-driven effort to define the uncertainty surrounding the various definitions of atmospheric rivers, and is particularly interested in how this uncertainty shapes our understanding of atmospheric rivers in a warmer world. Now, before I turn it over to Christine, let's check out y'all's thoughts on our word cloud question. Uh, so Paul, Brett, or Nick, would you be able to share Slido for us? Awesome, so I'm seeing lots of great answers up here. So lots of rain seems to be, to be the, the biggest one, and they definitely do produce lots of rains, and we'll hear from uh, Christine a little bit more about that. Uh, I'm seeing moisture, water, a uh, river in the atmosphere, uh, air currents, ocean, intense rainfall, wind, uh, wind temperature, pressure gradients, precipitation, river, uh, the Pacific Ocean. Um, yeah, so I'm seeing uh, lots of great themes up here. So maybe as we transition over to Christine, um, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts as, as I welcome you up here about our work cloud. Hi, Dan. Great, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, there's a yeah. These are all great um, responses to the word cloud, and I think they're all pretty applicable as well. So um, yeah, lots of rain. That's like the big thing with atmospheric rivers. They bring a ton of rain. Um, so I guess uh, shall we just proceed on to the presentation? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, uh, can we get the? There we go. All right, so thank you all for, for coming here to my presentation, both online and um, in person. So let's get started. Oops, oops, there we go. So what, here's my outline. What are atmospheric rivers? I'm gonna talk a little bit about what atmospheric rivers are. I'm using the acronym AR a lot in my presentation, so when you see AR, it means atmospheric rivers. Um, the uh, then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about where they occur and why they are important for climate. And then I will finish with uh, what happens to atmospheric rivers in a warmer world. All right, so the first question, what are atmospheric rivers? 
Well, one of the things that we um, say a lot as atmospheric scientists, my fellow atmospheric uh, river you know, researchers is, well, we'll know them when we see them. <laughs> And so this isn't really a scientific uh, explanation for what atmospheric rivers is, but it actually just helps to explain it a little bit when you look at pictures of atmospheric rivers. So here what I'm showing you are two uh, satellite photographs from uh, the NASA Earth Observatory. These were taken in October of 2017. This first one was October 14th, and this one down below, if you can follow my cursor, October uh, 17th. And in these, you can really just see this beautiful, long, banded structure, uh, weather structure, that's crossing the entire Pacific. It's thousands of miles long uh, and hun several hundred miles wide. And this is typically how we define an atmospheric river. Uh, incidentally, I grabbed these images from the Earth, uh, NASA Earth Observatory, but you can also find them on the Wikipedia page, which actually isn't too bad <laughs> when it, for the atmospheric river stuff. Um, all right. So let's see this. There we go. So how do we actually identify them? Well, we identify them often by their water content. And so this is what you're looking at is a looped image of an atmospheric river that's making landfall in the Pacific Northwest, um, it's right around here. And uh, it's a different type of satellite that you're looking at here. This is called a water vapor imagery. And it's uh, created from the um, uh, Cooperative Institute for Meteorology of Satellite Studies, that's based out of University of uh, Wisconsin in Madison. And what you're looking at, it's labeled up there, total precipitable water. And what that means is if you take all the water vapor that's in the atmosphere, and then you all of a sudden just precipitate it out, how much water comes out of the atmosphere, that's what we're actually looking at. And these um, colors down here, these red and orange colors, show you, uh, or where there's the most um, precipitable water in the atmosphere in this shot. And this is typical because it's the, um, the tropical bands and you have a lot of water vapor down there. But what you do see is this, um, the scooping of this um, mid-latitude, this, this tropical moisture into the mid-latitudes, into these long striated streams, which actually eventually make uh, landfall uh, in the, for in this case, the west coast of the US or the west coast of Canada. And this is really what we're talking about when we're talking about atmospheric rivers. Incidentally, this particular atmospheric river that's making landfall in the Pacific Northwest there produced about two to five inches of rain in the Seattle area. Oh, okay, so before we move to the next slide, do we have the answers for our first poll question? Because I'm gonna answer it in the next slide. So I thought we might actually answer the first question. We can. All right, um, so, yeah, so actually, this is really good. The answer, believe it or not, is similar to two Amazon rivers. So most of you were actually really close, <laughs> um, but it's similar to actually couple, like double, uh, a typical atmospheric river is similar to double the atmos uh, double on Amazon. So if I, we go back to the slides, and I forward advance my slides, I can show you. Just give a sec second here, I guess. Here we go. Um, atmospheric rivers are actually, believe it or not, the largest freshwater river on Earth. But we're not talking on the land, we're talking in the skies. Fresh water is actually in the atmosphere. Double the Amazon River, and for those of you who like to think in Mississippis instead of Amazon, it's about five, uh, seven to 15 uh, Mississippi rivers. This um, schematic I took from the NOAA website and it's a really nice a schematic that shows you what sort of happens mechanistically. You have warm, moist, atmospheric moisture from the tropics that just sort of uh, gets pushed uh, along in the atmosphere until it hits the landmass. And then it interacts with that, the mountain ranges, and uh, the air gets sort of pushed up. And then as it gets pushed up, it cools, it condenses, clouds form, those clouds get heavy, and then you have this precipitation and, and heavy rain and heavy snow is the result. So this is sort of uh, the, 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 the mechanistically what happens with atmospheric rivers. All right. So when we think of atmospheric rivers, they're actually, it's not just all water. They're actually two different things. You have the water part, and then you have the transport part. So atmospheric rivers are comprised of both water and wind. Integrated vapor transport, this is another acronym, IVT, is a, a variable that we use as a typical way we measure 
the intensity of an atmospheric river, and is comprised of both water and wind. So from a, a practical sense, when we forecast these things, uh, we look at IVT. And so this, these series of images um, I, I sort of grabbed from an operational center that's centered uh, in Scripps, the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, and I have that website up there for those who want to take a look at it. This is an operational center that forecasts atmospheric rivers, and this is a typical product that comes out of it. They run this model, and they show this integrated vapor transport intensity, which is these really dark, dark colors. It shows you how strong the atmospheric river is. And in some cases, they do what we call reconnaissance missions, where they put airplanes into the sky, and they crisscross uh, the atmospheric river to take measurements so we can understand them better. Uh, sort of like hurricane hunters putting, you know, uh, flying hurricanes into the eye, uh, flying airplanes into the eye of a hurricane. These guys fly, fly their air airplanes uh, into atmospheric rivers. So that's uh, sort of a really fun thing that they do that gives us a lot of good data. So um, atmospheric rivers are actually often attached to wintertime low pressure systems. So I've um, taken here on the left. This is a schematic from the glossary of meteorology, which is produced by the American Meteorological Society. And it's, a, a, it's just sort of like a, we call a plain view way of looking what's happening with the atmospheric river compared to the low pressure systems in the area. So here's your low pressure system, and you have these frontal boundaries. And the atmospheric river, the moisture piece, just sort of gets scooped up by this trailing front. Uh, and this moisture transport here, this is really what we're talking about when we're talking about the atmospheric river, this long, narrow piece. I've tried to superimpose that onto a real world picture, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is this picture over here on the left, the satellite picture from NOAA. Um, we have this, the atmospheric river is this sort of piece underneath the, the front I've drawn, and the, the green circle is really, the this is what I'm talking about. We're talking about atmospheric river. This is where the water is being transported. All right, so what is actually pushing these atmospheric rivers along? So um, uh, this is this uh, loop that I'm showing you is another example of these you know, water uh, vapor satellite pictures with different examples of atmospheric rivers. This one in particular I'm talking about is actually called the Pineapple Express. I saw that in the word cloud, so some of you know what the Pineapple Express is. It's just a flavor of a type of an atmospheric river, and it's called Pineapple Express because you can see the Hawaiian Islands here, and the moisture is sort of being transported from the Hawaiian Island region all the way into the West Coast, and so hence Pineapple in Hawaii, Pineapple Express. But what is pushing these things along? Well, the jet streams. So jet streams are narrow and fast-moving streams of air that blow from west to east in the same direction of the rotation of the Earth. And so I've grabbed this uh, nice schematic uh, from the Science Photo Library, and it shows you sort of how the Earth rotates over here in that little, those little arrows up above. And then we have the globe. We have two different types of jet streams that I'd like to highlight are important for atmospheric rivers. So the blue one is what we're calling the polar jet. And this separates the polar regions from the mid-latitude band, which is sort of where we live. Uh, the red one is the subtropical jet. And that um, is, uh, separates the mid-latitude band sort of from the equator. So it's these two types of jets that interact with our day-to-day, -day, that interact with our weather uh, to produce and move the atmospheric rivers um, to where they're going. All right, so this is just sort of like a pause for a second. So uh, to give you a couple tools that you can do on your own after the lecture, <laughs> um, you know, in your own time, I put um, the uh, a web, uh, web link here for this the water, water vapor of imagery uh, website. It's freely, it's freely downloadable data, so you can take a look at this sort of stuff. And this is a great uh, tool to use um, to try to just if you care about, if you like uh, to looking at weather maps and stuff. And so this atmospheric river was just last week or so, like a week and a half ago. And it, it made impact, uh, or it made landfall in the Pacific Northwest. And there's sort of two pieces to this. The first piece was this moisture that was sort of scooping up from the subtropical band. And the second piece was what actually got pushed into the Pacific Northwest. So let's just jump over to this other tool called earth.nullschool.net. 
And this is something that you could go on the, on your, on the web and it's an interactive tool. You click on it and you can move the globes around uh, and you can pick all sorts of things like you know, look at winds or you can even look at clouds and a uh, bunch of different stuff. I'll let you play with that on your own. Um, but I wanted to show it to, sh to show you this was the, time, the same time that this is what the jets looked like at this time where these atmospheric rivers were happening. So if I can draw your attention to this piece here, this is part of the subtropical jet, is grabbing this, you know, sort of, uh, the, the United States is sort of right here. It's sort of hard to see, but the white line is sort of the outline here. So this is the West Coast. So the subtropical um, jet is sort of pulling up moisture, and that's this piece right here. And then, th then it gets into the polar-driven jet region, and so that moisture gets scooped up into the polar jet, and then the polar jet just pushes it into the Pacific Northwest, and that was our atmospheric river transport that happened uh, just a week and a half ago. So uh, if there's an atmospheric river that's forecast to happen, you can go to these different tools, and you can see and play with what's happening on your own. All right, so how do we measure um, the uh, strength of an AR? So there's a new scale that came out. Was, this was developed by the the uh, CW3E crew over at Scripps. And it uses two different um, quantities. The first is IVT, which is our integrated vapor transport, which incorporates both wind and water. And then the second is the duration, meaning how long it's going to last. And so um, like, a, like the category scale you have for hurricanes, this is a category scale we have for atmospheric rivers. And over here on the left, uh, this is sort of like a diagram that shows you what's going on here. So on the x-axis is the duration, so how long it lasts. The y-axis is the, the maximum strength of IVT, so this is how strong it is in terms of water and wind. And then we can, you know, calculate these two, th these two things or grab them from our observations and um, put a category onto the atmospheric river. So, for example, if an atmospheric river is five... 550 uh, kilogram per meter per second, and this is the unit we use, kilogram per meter per second, which is mass and speed, uh, and it lasts only for 24 hours. It's considered a category one, which is sort of a moderate, and that's beneficial. It just gives rain. It doesn't, it's not, um, not too intense, and it just replenishes water, uh, water sources. And then, if, however, if it's long, too long, or quite intense, then it's a category five which means it's, it's primarily hazardous and it's probably going to cause floods. All right, so that's sort of the atmospheric 101, uh, what atmospherics are, rivers are. So where do atmospheric rivers occur? Well, they typically occur in mid-latitudes because this is where the interaction with the jets happen. Uh, and the most common locations is the west coast of continents. So you've seen this one. This was our Pineapple Express that was in making impact uh, around California. Uh, however, they're very common also in Europe. And so here, this is US here, on, and this is uh, the European continent here, and Africa right here. And this is the Atlantic Ocean, and you can see the moisture that's just being pushed from the Caribbean area all the way up into um, Europe. Other regions that are common is in South America, in the Southern Hemisphere. We have the Western South America, the, the um, uh, the uh, the country of Chile is very uh, has a very is very commonly uh, influenced by atmospheric rivers, and so this is an example of an atmospheric river uh, making impact uh, in that uh, on uh, on the coastlines of Chile. Uh, South Africa is another uh, con a place where there you see a lot of atmospheric rivers, and incidentally, I, and a lot of interspersed in a lot of my slides, I have citations for scientific publications where I've grabbed this information from. And so if people are interested and are able, you can uh, grab on, um, you can look up those citations if you like. But I just uh, need to credit wherever I'm getting the information from. Uh, so for the South Africa one, these uh, colors are, uh, show the different, the strength of IVT. And so you can see it, this is South America right over here. And this is uh, Africa right here. And so you can see the, the atmospheric rivers sort of cross over the South Atlantic and hit the tip of South uh, Africa. Also, interestingly, we see them in Australia quite a bit. This is a satellite picture uh, that's actually um, taking a moisture stream from the tropical, deep in the tropic band, and, and it's uh, pushing, being pushed along 
into, um, across Australia into the Eastern Australia region and Western uh, New Zealand. So there's quite a few Australian atmospheric rivers as well. All right, so um, less typical, but also other regions that, that atmospheric rivers are, have impact. Uh, Northeastern North America, believe it or not. So you know, uh, even though um, you know, it's not a west coast of the US, there's the east coast, you can, there are times where moisture from the you know, deep in the Caribbean gets pushed up along in, uh, the, the Atlantic. And here is, in this particular example, is um, impacting Newfoundland and beyond. Uh, here we have East Asian examples with the Korean Peninsula. And believe it or not, actually, the Middle East sometimes experiences atmospheric rivers. They're quite rare here, but they still happen. So this is, this is an atmospheric river that's streaming across Africa and impacting the Arabian Peninsula. Also, we have uh, atmospheric rivers that, hit, that influence uh, the, the polar regions, Antarctica and, and, the, and the Arctic. This is an Antarctica example. Uh, so um, this happened just earlier this year. There was an uh, extreme event that was coupled with uh, extreme heat that uh, produced an atmospheric river that made an impact in East Antarctica. So this little bit is East Antarctica. Over here is Australia, just to orient you. Everything is sort of flipped because it's upside down. <laughs> and then, um, so this atmospheric river actually was the last straw in the collapse of the Conger Ice Shelf. Uh, Conger Ice Shelf was actually uh, stressed before this, and this was just sort of the last, the last straw, but um, this is sort of the piece that actually uh, contributed to that collapse. This image in the middle is a satellite photograph that shows you this, like the rough looking white stuff, that's, those are the clouds in the atmospheric river, and the smoother white is Antarctica. And this image over here is just, um, shows you how anomalous or how, how um, the, de the departure from what, the, what normally is in terms of temperature, how strange those temper strangely warm temperatures are ac they actually occur during that period. During this, um, this, this warm, uh, this bullet that you see right here, that's actually, Antarctica's actually flipped in terms of rotation here. This area here sort of uh, corresponds to this area here. This area here, we had temperatures that were over 70 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. Uh, so this was a this was a really profound extreme event that was uh, in, closely tied with, to an atmospheric river. And then we also have them in the Arctic. And I like this example because this is sort of fun. This happened just last month where we have Hurricane Fiona that influenced the uh, eastern seaboard. We have the remnants of Hurricane Fiona. You can totally see right here as it spins up that gets scooped into a different moisture stream and then eventually... Uh, uh, cuts across the tip of Greenland, and that was an atmospheric river that occurred in Greenland just, just last month. All right, so now we're on to why are atmospheric rivers important for climate? And I think it's time for our second poll question. So yeah, and actually everyone got this one, or most looked like the majority of people got this one correct. The answer is yes, 10%. There are very there are long and narrow types of uh, features, and so even though they transport most of the moisture that we see from the tropics into the mid latitudes, they actually only account for a really small surface area. So good job, everyone. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, and so here we go. Here's the sort of explanatory slide that I have for this, um, but I don't, uh, yeah. So anyway, I hear, uh, I've just sort of written out what I just said, even though airs move about 90% of the poleward uh, water vapor outside of the tropics, which I have grayed out here, they only occupy 10% of the space. And this is, you can visually see this by just looking at this, this map. You can see just how there's very, uh, the different atmospheric rivers uh, that really take up only a small, a small space. So this is why they're really important for climate because they really are the one of the primary movers of moisture uh, of, of, uh, from the tropics into the, uh, the exotropics. Aside from tr tropical cyclones, of course, they're also very important. All right. So uh, another reason why they're important for climate is that what we're, we're, we can call them drought busters. This term was actually coined by Mike Denger, who I'm crediting with this series of images here. He uh, is a retired USGS person. 
Um, he uh, did a study where he looked at atmospheric river, uh, the drought severity in the, the western air, California, Nevada, uh, Oregon areas um, before and after a series of atmospheric rivers. So this panel on the left uh, is um, from a period in January in 2010 where we had anywhere between um, abnormally dry to severe drought. And then this middle panel here is the precipitation that, that occurred during a series of atmospheric rivers that week. And so where the darkest blues are sort of correspond to this next image, the grays here, uh, where these are re regions in the West are no longer under drought because those atmospheric rivers basically provided enough moisture to uh, lift those localized regions out of drought. So they're, they're very important uh, to um, sources of uh, moisture for, for, these, for these regions, especially uh, you know, wintertime precipitation, which is the primary, amount, primary time where atmospheric rivers occur, Oct October through March. Okay. So this is also, I like to throw this example up here just to show you what water managers might use in terms of trying to understand and prepare for future uh, or for their you know, near future climate uh, and water resources. This is an example I grabbed from the California website uh, and, uh, for water managers. You have, um, you can, you can, you know, I don't expect everyone to actually like, this is pretty small to see, but you can click different years to see what years, what the water, what the amount of water that was accumulated that years, and you can compare it to what's average. So to explain the figure a little bit, on the x-axis is um, the water, what I'm saying by water year. So this starts in October 1st, and it goes for a full year, and it basically just accumulates all the precipitation, or all the, you know, the water that eventually falls uh, into the basins that, for these particular basins that we're looking at in California. And you can see by the time you hit, you know, by the end of March or April, which is sort of the atmospheric river season season, you can see that most of the precipitation and most of the water that is used by these regions has fallen by that time. So, so without the atmospheric rivers there, you know, you would have a, a, a year that might have a very low water year, which would be one of these two years. Or if, it's a, if you have a lot of atmospheric rivers, you would have, you know, it would be way up here above normal. And this is exactly what this, um, this, this uh, figure is meant to, um, to communicate to you. ARs either make or break water years for many locations. And so uh, this was 2017, which was a record year for California in terms of, uh, in terms of water. And this was also not coincidentally. <laughs> the, the reason why is this because it had this, this year just had a ton of atmospheric rivers. There are many, many atmospheric rivers of all sorts of intensities that fell during this year. And this was, this, this was really the primary reason why this year was a record water year. Uh, another important piece to climate are extreme events. And so atmospheric rivers often, if they especially are, if they're in their category four and five, those high, really intense ones, uh, they can contribute to um, uh, severe flooding. And so this um, is just sort of an example of a series of atmospheric rivers that happened that caused the Oroville Dam to collapse back in uh, February of 2017. So this was, if, if you are from California or um, follow California news, you probably have remembered this incident. It was a pretty major deal with this, this dam that collapsed, and here's sort of a picture of it. This is the atmospheric river that sort of um, was the final straw to that collapse, and you, I've shown you this a couple different times already. This was the Pineapple Express that you know, grabbed and sucked all that moisture into the Feather uh, River Basin here, and I put a star where the basin is. Um, but yeah, 13 inches of rain fell in a very, very short amount of time to, to cause this collapse. So, um, so yeah, the, so not only are they beneficial, they can also be quite destructive. But the West Coast is not the only place that, that gets extreme events. Um, there are many other places, just like we saw where they occur. Um, the, this uh, study was done by David Lavers. He's over in Europe at the ECMWF facility. He, um, he looked at the top 10 UK flooding events, and all top 10 flooding events for all these locations that I've labeled A, B, C, and D, which correspond to A, B, C, and D, 
all of these events were atmospheric rivers, and you can see the trajectories of each of these. Um, so uh, again, very important in terms of climate. So I wanted to throw this in here uh, for Antarctica because this is also, they're also very important uh, in terms of the snow accumulation that happens on the ice sheets in Antarctica. This is work um, that Michelle McLennan, who is the PhD student at University of Colorado, has been doing. Uh, she cares about uh, what's going on with uh, Thwaites Glacier. This is a picture of the different, of the actual instrumentation that they use to capture uh, this data. Uh, and this figure on, in the middle is, act, is, the, is a graph of the snow accumulation uh, during the, the several months from January to, to March or April uh, during the, at these two different camps. And I can't remember. I think this might be Cavity Camp, but I might be, I might be wrong which one is which. But the point I'm making is that this circle, um, event that I've circled, was an atmospheric river that happened over Thwaites Glacier, and it bumped... Uh, the accumulation in a massive amount just by that one atmospheric rivers. And if we take a look at that from a climatological perspective, which is this figure on the far right, this little red point here, this is, this is, what we're, this is the event that we're talking about. And we compare it to climatology, which is this gray curve area, we can see that this atmospheric river would far surpass what the climatological snow accumulation is for these events. And this year was also a big year for Antarctica atmospheric rivers. We had two more during the course of the year. On the flip side, it can also uh, account uh, for a weakening uh, ice uh, shelf stability. This has happened in Greenland as well as Antarctica, but I'm using this Antarctica example because this is a really nice paper by Jonathan Willey. He's a researcher in, in Switzerland at the moment, and he um, did this nice study analyzing the, uh, that this uh, ice shelf weakening in the Antarctic Peninsula, which is this little point right here. This is South America. Here's Antarctica sort of rotated, so you can see the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, these uh, colors are, these warm colors are the departures from normal in terms of sea surface temperature. So the, the yellow and the orange show you a really warm sea surface temperature, and these black lines are the trajectory. So you see the atmosphere river sort of moving over the warm area and then eventually making impact on the Antarctic Peninsula. This figure here uh, that I'm, uh, that's labeled D shows you the actual integrated vapor transport with that, with that particular event. Uh, and then we move up here to this image, this, this photograph, this uh, satellite photograph that shows you the, what the Larsen A and B ice sheets look like before the event. And then this middle figure is the, what was happening in terms of the atmosphere river during the event. You can see the atmosphere river uh, right here in that striated cloud looking area. And then after the event, you can see the disintegration of the ice sheet. So again, very, very important for, uh, for climate, for not only mid-latitudes, but for, um, for high latitudes as well. Okay, so that brings us to the final piece of the talk, is, which, is, which was the title. <laughs> What happens to atmospheric rivers in a warmer world? Okay, so now that we have all this background, let's actually talk about what happens to atmospheric rivers in a warmer world. All right. So to talk, to talk about what happens with atmospheric rivers in a warmer world, we need to talk a little bit about climate models, Earth system models. The models are a, a glorified computer program that actually compute uh, fields like temperature and precipitation and wind. Uh, on a gridded data set. And what I mean by a gridded data set, I, I've sort of put a, um, this little image here where you can see the globe and that mesh that looks over, oh, that's, that's wrapped around the globe. So you wrap this mesh around the globe and the intersection of all these uh, you know, intersection points, we call those grid points. And at each of these grid points, we do these calculations, which actually then tell us uh, then we can analyze that help us to understand what's happening with temperature, what's happening with winds, what's happening with precipitation. So all of these things that are calculated are actually listed, or some of them are listed here in this schematic, things like ocean currents and sea ice and wind and precipitation evaporation. All this stuff is calculated on these grid points. And then, and then we look at the, as scientists, we look at this data and then we, you know, if we simulate uh, a, a period of time with 
enhanced greenhouse gases, we can try to understand what happens to the climate with the warming world. And then, and then uh, the step beyond that for us is, what do atmospheric rivers do on these? But we're looking at them in these models and gridded data sets. OK, so let's go back to this basic figure. AR for ARs, we need to consider both water and wind for climate change. So warmer air means more water is available to ARs in the atmosphere. And so this is um, simulations by the Community Earth System Model, CESM, uh, for two different periods. This period on the, 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 in the middle here, uh, this, the, the leftmost uh, blue-red figure, is uh, and we call this an historical period, and this means like uh, you know it's already happened or it's happening. It's, it's sort of like modern times, and so this uh, this sort of uh, figure you can trip in is this is sort of what the atmosphere looks like now in terms of precipitable water. Remember, this is the, the the variable where if you take it all and you precipitate it out, that's how much water is in the atmosphere. This figure on the right is a future climate. So this is what the world looks like under future um, greenhouse gases more with that are elevated. And then this figure on the bottom is the difference. And so you can see everything is red, <laughs> which means that pretty much when we warm our atmosphere, we have more water that's available into the atmosphere. So there's just more water that that's, exists as a water vapor in the atmosphere. So that's our water piece. And we know we're going to have a lot more water. The second piece is winds. So winds are what we call dynamic. They move around. And this is actually a little bit more complicated, and it's very, very active area of research. So if we go back to our, um, our figure of the globe, where we're looking at our jet streams, we have our polar jet stream, which is projected to move poleward um, during, with, a, with enhanced uh, greenhouse gas warming. For the subtropical jet, which is this red one, this is projected to sort of expand and intensify. And so these two things will interact with our daily weather. And, and how they interact is actually a little bit tricky to try to diagnose and understand. Um, but this is what we need to do when we try, want to try to figure out what's happening with atmospheric rivers. So this is a figure um, that is looking at the difference in what's happening with just the wind component. So ARs track with jet streams, as I've mentioned. So where the jets move, so will the atmospheric rivers. So what I'm, this figure is actually looking at um, the difference between like a business as usual scenario, what the, the worst uh, amount of, you know, the, the warmest the, we, we could project the world to be in terms of you know, no stops on emissions. And then we subtract that from what's happening now. And then we can see what the difference is. And so this is the west coast of the US. And zero means the equator. And we'll just take a look at these enhanced uh, oranges. So this tells us that the, um, that the jet streams will, uh, in, will, will strengthen in this subtropical region. And for the polar region, the blues tell us that, that, that for this particular simulation says that we expect the jets to decrease. And so this has implications for where ARs are going to be. So if we look at that from different regions around the world, and this is work that I have um, t uh, collaborated with and taken with from Ashley Payne. She has this, there, this is the citation for the, where this work has been published. It's in Nature Review Journals in terms of atmospheric rivers and climate change. It's a very nice diagnosis of um, what the state of the literature as it is right now in terms of you know, what we know in terms of atmospheric rivers and climate change. We, she's produced this really nice plot that is, we're, we're breaking it up in between the water piece and the wind piece. And so the water piece, for different regions, I'll just say the, this is the West Pacific. So this is like Japan. Uh, Australia is right here. The South Pacific and South America. This is South America, and this is uh, the South Pacific. And then here, the South Atlantic and, and, and South Africa. So for all these regions, the water is just going to increase. And so this is something we understand from that earlier plot we saw with the community or system model. These black uh, contour lines should, uh, meet, are meant to represent what is, uh, what the, where the core of the IVT, this integrated vapor transport, 
or the strength of where the ARs are, where that's actually, where the core, average core is actually gonna live. So this, these little black enhanced lines with this concentric circles tells you this is where we expect the atmospheric rivers sort of to be uh, um, at, at, at the current times. And then the, the colors in the background is the, what's projected in the future. So if we look at the wind piece uh, on the right here, this hopefully this explanation will make, start to make a little more sense where the colors are blue is where IVT um, is decreasing and the reds are where IVT is increasing. And so if we take a look at these same black lines where we expect the core of the IVT going to be, so for example, in the South Africa piece, we see that the IVT is projected to decrease and then the IVT is projected to increase a little bit to the north of that. And so what this type of figure tells us is that that core of the IVT is sort of expected to shift equatorward. And so that would draw atmospheric waves away from the tip of South Africa and potentially decrease the amount of water that's available to them. And so if we look at different regions, you can see all of these different blues and reds and you know where things are shifting is different for each region. So um, the lesson from a, to be learned from a, a figure like this is that regionally, um, atmospheric rivers are gonna do something different depending on where you are, what region you are, and where the, what the winds are gonna do in the particular region that you are, that you're, that you're looking at. So it's a very regional specific thing, unlike the water piece where it's just gonna get wetter everywhere. All right, so let's just step back to the water piece because this is, even though we know that there's gonna be more water, what does it actually mean? Well, what it means that we're probably gonna have more intense precipitation. So this is work that was um, led by Alan Rhodes. And uh, if you're interested, there's the citation right there. And he ran the community air system model for, uh, for, for um, what we're calling historical simulations and, and future climate simulations. So, 1985 to 2015 was what we call our historical period, and our 2070 to 2100 is what we're calling our future period. And he, we're looking at the amount of water, or amount of precipitation that was produced from ARs by category. So the x-axis is the, the month of the year, October through August, and the y-axis is the amount of precipitation. Where there is no color, means these, this, the precipitation that fell in this, for, these, for these months and these ranges, there wasn't an, there, it was not an AR, but for the ARs are colored by category. So uh, here we have, for example here, uh, can't reach that, the 46% means that 46% of the precipitation for January for the historical period was due to an AR. So that's how you interpret this sort of figure. So the figure on the, on the, um, the far right is the difference between the two. And so the one thing that does pop out to everyone's eyes, you see a lot of red, right? So the red is telling us that in the, from the future simulate, uh, in a future type of climate, we expect more precipitation from these category five, these most in, ex, intense and extreme uh, types of atmospheric rivers. So that is what we expect in the future. Uh, Depending, so we don't know where they're necessarily going to land because that that depends on where the wind is going to go. But where they do land, uh, they will the, whatever precipitation is in there will be more extreme. All right, so this is sort of like a summary figure, and again, this is out of Ashley's paper, the Paint et al. in 2020. And so you can spend a lot of time with this figure, but it's a great summary figure. So this is why I like to sort of choose it. So here we the uh, the pink here is the um, uh, just represents what we expect atmospheric rivers to do in terms of um, frequency and counts just due to more water, more, more water availability. Just these are just basically where the storm tracks are. These different icons are very specific metrics. This metric over here is what we call in frequency. This is simply just the, the air counts. The, the little um, Locator symbol here is uh, location where the atmospheric rivers are going to fall. So this is where the winds are gonna, this is the wind piece, how that, those winds move back and forth. Um, we have precipitation and the precipitation extreme icons, and we have a um, melt icon and then a flooding icon. So let's just take a look at the Western US, for example. We see that most of these things are red, which means we expect increases in all of these things. But the locator icon is part red, 
in part blue. And this is, has to do with the red is that polar jet that's being pushed forward, and the red is where the subtropical jet is intensifying. So ARs that are um, influenced by the subtropical jet are going may increase, and those are, are um, influenced by the pole, polar jet for the Western North America are, are expected to decrease depending on where the, the jets go. Uh, for example, another example here would be um, in the uh, South Africa piece, we saw this in the previous uh, the two, fig, two uh, slides ago where I was showing you the different, um, the IVT cores and where the winds are expected to go for different regions. Uh, we have an expected decrease in precipitation and the location. Uh, but, but a lot of this other stuff is grayed out, and the gray sort of means it's not really resolved yet. There's still a lot of uncertainty. And so if you just take a look at in a lot of these different icons, you can see there's a lot of, a lot of gray here, which means there's still a lot of work to be done and a lot, a lot of understanding that has to happen before we really understand what atmospheric rivers are going to do uh, from region to region. Okay, so I, I often also get asked what... Does the, shape of, uh, does the shape of an air change with warming? And this is sort of hard to answer because this also depends on how you define an AR in models, or maybe I should rather have said gridded data sets. Because we actually look at these things in gridded data sets, we have to you know, have an algorithm that says, OK, for, so for these great gridded data sets, this here and here, this is what the spatial footprint looks like. So depending on what research group and what research question you're doing, you may have a slightly different way of defining the spatial footprint on a gridded data set than the next person. And so that's has sort of what happened in the community we have, the, and the, which is this figure right here that shows these, all these different color outlines, show you all the different ways that are now currently in the community which people define a particular atmospheric river. There is this, this purple one that's like a sort of a broad uh, spatial footprint, and then we have this green one which is sort of a narrow spatial footprint. So what do we do? <laughs> to try to understand what's happening when there's so many different ways of actually defining it on a gridded data set. Well, there is an effort out there called ARTMIP, and this is something I'm heavily involved in, called the Atmospheric River Tracking Method Intercomparison Project. And one of the things that we want to do is we want to try to understand what's going to happen, just, uh, you know, what are the differences just due to this, these different definitions, and how we can take that information and then say something about climate change. So what the, what we need to do is we actually need to look at all of these different types of ways of defining them, and we need to look at the range of answers before we can actually say something. And so this is what this plot is trying to do. It's taking this range of different ways that, um, this, uh, of, of defining an atmospheric river on a gridded data set, and it's applying it to a model, and then we're looking at you know, the historical period, which is the black and the the uh, future period, which is the red, and we're looking at the climatology. So the x-axis is the month of the year, and the y-axis is, the, it's labeled as percent of AR condition at coastline, but that's just sort of fancy for saying how many counts, how many ARs hit the coast, okay? So at first glance, you can see, oh, well, for the North American West Coast, it seems like there's gonna be an increase, and yeah, that's, that's what the literature sort of tells us. But if you look closely, you can see the range of answers sometimes overlap each other. And so that means there's still some uncertainty on how we're, uh, what we really need to say about, uh, about the, what's going to happen with atmospheric rivers just based on how we're defining it on these gridded data sets. So we want to look at the full range before we actually say, give an answer like, yes, atmospheric rivers are going to increase. We can say, well, yeah, they're going to increase, but there's this range of possibilities. And so this is uh, another way of looking at the different range of possibilities, but also with precipitation. This is actually a little bit more robust. There's less, there's more agreement here. And so I'll step you through these figures, this figure, because it's a little complicated. Um, the x-axis is uh, the, um, we're calling the rain rate. So this is the intensity. This is, these are precipitation distributions. And the distribution is basically, we're looking at different intensities and how much rain falls with the, for a given intensity. So for this three to five degree, or three to five bin of, millimeter, of rain rate, that is sort of like a moderate or a drizzle. And uh, to, uh, 150 to 200 millimeter per day is like, it's pouring. So the, 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 uh, the bins on the left 
are, are less or light precipitation, the bins on the right are intense precipitation. So, for example, for S, the SWUS, that's Southwest US, we take a look at these moderate, rate, these moderate rates. The grays are the historical and the reds are the future. And, you can, and so what this figure is telling us is that we expect the, in the future to be, there to be less precipitation falling in this moderate rate. But if we move over to the extreme rates, we see that the red is now more than the, uh, over the, uh, over the uh, gray line. So that tells us that there's, we expect more precipitation to occur in these extreme rates. And this is robust and pretty consistent across all these methods. All right, so another thing is, is there a climate change fingerprint um, already? And there are people that are thinking about this. And so uh, this was a study led by Allison McCallis, and this was looking at that Oroville Dam event. And so uh, this little icon that showed to remind you what the, or that the which is the um, series of atmospheric rivers that causes the dam collapse. So what they did is they ran this uh, regional climate model called Model for Prediction Across Scales, that's MPAS. And they ran this model to uh, simulate this, what this storm would have been like in the past, which is the blue line. And then they simulated it to you know, what it actually happened in current times, which is the, the, the black line. And then near future and present, and, uh, and then, and then you know, far future uh, with conditions. So the past means there's less greenhouse gases, in the far future, it means there's more greenhouse gases. So as you go um, uh, from the past to the future, you see that the, in, the intensity of this storm would have been much less in the past and much more in the future. And so if we look at this in terms of precipitation during the course of the, of the storm, there were two pulses, one between February 7th and 8th, and one another one between February 9th and 10th. And you can see, again, this progression of what this storm would have been like in the past in the blue and what have been like more in the future in the far red. And you do see that one, there is a small climate change signal that's already happened because what would have happened, the, the current simulation was, shows more precipitation than it would have been in the past. But we also see that in the far future, the precipitation would be much more severe. So there's, there's other people that are doing these types of things. And this is a study by Huang and, um, and Swain, uh, this was actually just published. This is the arc storm scenario, where they're trying to figure out, OK, what's the worst storm that happened in the, in the historical past? I mean, call that arcist. And that's what these two bands. And then what's the worst storm that happened, uh, could happen in the future with enhanced greenhouse gases? And this is arc future. These upper panels show these departures from sea surface temperature. So these are where there's reds and oranges, where the sea surface temperatures are warm. And these bottom panels are showing you the integrated vapor transport. By now, everyone is familiar with the IVT and the integrated vapor transport and how these look. So you can just sort of see that the arc future just looks pretty devastating. So, but what do we do with this information? This is a super high resolution. I mean, there's like all uh, the fidelity is really high, and um, those grid points are very close together. Uh, so that way we can resolve what's happening on a local scale much better than we could if, if it was a global model. We take that information and then we, we try, produce um, metrics that water managers can use, such as what is the hourly precipitation rate or what's the hourly runoff rate? And once we have this information and then the water managers can, you know, can take this information and then plan for what we need to do in the future. So we are trying to prepare uh, for these mega, any type of megastorm that might happen in the future. All right, so I think that's all I really had to present to you. So let me just sort of give you a summary. Uh, the atmospheric rivers are important for Earth's water cycle and local climates, and hopefully I've convinced you of this. They are comprised of water and wind. Um, water availability will increase in future climate uh, and will more likely have uh, intense precipitation associated with that. The changes in the winds and the jets will be regionally dependent. And, and then finally, um, by studying ARs in the future, we can prepare for any changes and uh, be prepared. <laughs> Here's a final slide I have with just a bunch of resources and tools with different websites that I've mentioned if for those of people who want to go and play with stuff on their own. 
Um, and here's also a list of operational centers that I talked about that talk up that, that produce actual atmospheric river forecasts and other products. There's also one here I wanted to highlight in Chile, South America, which is sort of the counterpart to the one that scripts uh, for South America as well. So with that, I'll stop. Awesome, thank you, Christine. Um, so we have just over 20-ish minutes for questions. Um, so as a reminder for folks that are that are in person, you can just simply raise your hand and ask your question and the room microphones will, will pick up your sound. And then for folks that are online, you can uh, just ask your questions through the Slido platform. And then for these links as well, I can also point folks to, uh, to Slido. If you click on that hamburger menu, the, the three horizontal lines, there's a drop down there that'll also summarize all of uh, these links and some other websites that Christine shared throughout her presentation. And so as, as we collect our, our thoughts maybe in person uh, for some questions, there's, a, there's already a couple online. Uh, the first was from AJ who was wondering um, how El Nino and, and La Nina might impact um, atmospheric rivers. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, with El Nino and uh, La Nina tend to, in, for uh, West Coast and like the, the Western, the, yeah, the West Coast of the US and California that has a, has a really big impact because El Nino will create, you know, warmer SSTs or cooler SSTs depending what phase you're on. And so, with the warmer SSTs, there is some correlation to uh, increased atmospheric river activity. And so, one of the things that we that just preliminarily have found is that um, with a with a El, with a El Nino, you do see more of an atmospheric river coming into Southern California. But um, but as I said, like. Not all El Nino flavors are the same. <laughs> and so you have, uh, you can have an El Nino that may actually produce less precipitation on California than, you know, uh, uh, than a, a La Nina, for example. So, um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I feel like they're, they're, these modes of variability are, need to be um, uh, investigated a lot more deeply before we can actually say anything for sure. But that, that is a, a definitely an active area of research. Okay. Any in-person questions? Yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to pick up on something that I learned a lot. Um, you talked about ARs being drought enders. They can also end the fire season and uh, really ramp up, uh, you know, bring a lot of moisture to our fields. Can you talk a little bit about how they might, sh how ARs might shift in seasonality, um, particularly maybe for the West Coast? Yeah. So um, uh, I don't, but from what we've seen before, seen in like some of these simulations that I, I, I could I could go back to the slide that sort of showed the seasonality a little bit. Um, there don't seem like because there's a depending on where you are in California or even like Northern California to Southern California, it. You know, it, it matter. Um, it's not clear what you know what what month is going to be the most active for atmospheric rivers. So it really is going to follow the jet, the seasonal flow of the jet. So um, uh, that you don't see a big change in seasonality for the for the for the future climate, but there is some hint that October might be a little bit uh, more active. Um, just because, it, it, you know, just sort of the, the warm season sort of expanding a little bit. But, um, but as I said, I'm, I'm very hesitant to actually give you like a, a firm answer just because I feel like, especially for, for um, West Coast ARs, there's still, I feel like there's still most, so much uncertainty in what's going to happen in the future because of what those jets are going to be doing, especially the eddy driven jet, like where it's going to move and, and, for, and to what degree. It's really hard to it's really hard to say that, but but maybe October <laughs> will expand. So great, we'll take a, another question from online, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your, your name correctly, but from Yuan Fu Li is wondering what altitude do atmospheric rivers lie in the atmosphere? And does the wind in the lower atmosphere matter in transporting water? That's a really good question. I didn't really talk about levels of of the of where the atmospheric river is, but that but that matters. So the jets we tend to think are in the upper level, but the water most of the water actually lives in the in the bottom the bottom part of the the atmosphere. Um, you know what we call like the boundary layer. So you know maybe the first few you know um, 
uh, I'm trying to convert millibars to <laughs> to thousands of feet or whatever. But um, but yeah, so the, just the lower part of the atmosphere. Um, so so what the, a lot often though what's happening with a low level jet um, mirrors what's happening with an upper level jet. But the the atmospheric river itself is often considered a low level phenomenon just because that's where all the water is. But you have the water in the bottom part. But the driving piece of that is in the upper levels, so so there is a, there is a little bit of a disconnect. I'm not sure if I answered that question um, enough for for you, but um, you can follow up again, I guess. <laughs> yeah, following up on the the fire question, um, <clears throat> is there any research being done about the potential impacts of, uh, of increased atmospheric rivers or increased moisture on uh, things like debris flows, you know, post-fire debris flows in California, things like that? Absolutely. There are a number of people that are doing that research. Um, there are some people out of the Desert uh, Research Institute in Nevada, um, and there are some people at the Scripps Center, the CW3E groups, but they are definitely... Um, there is definitely that's a very active area of research, actually. Yeah, and I'm not coming up with a name off the top of my head right now, but I, if you get back to me, I can I can get you some names. Great, and as we take our, our next online question, Tim is also actually wondering if you would put up the cure conclusion slide again, just so some folks online could get a snapshot of it. Yeah. Um, okay. And then taking the the next question from Liz is wondering: Do more intense atmospheric rivers travel further inland? Yeah, actually, another really good question, everyone. So, yeah, they, they do, the more intense ones will penetrate deeper into, you know, the continents just because they have more stuff and it takes longer for it to rain out. But typically, you know, the inland ARs don't, aren't quite as intense as the, the, the ones on the coast just because by the, by, by the time they reach inland, they've rained out a lot, right? And, and then as they go, as the, these... Weather systems move over the the mountains on the uh, like the the continental divide on the other side, um, that uh, they tend to be more windy and less wet, uh, just because of you know that the uh, the mountains tend to squeeze all the moisture out. Uh, but but the more if, if the more intense it is, the more likely they will actually get further inland for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a modeling question. So I saw a whole bunch of different models that you put on top of each other, and there yeah. looked to be quite a sizable difference. And yeah, in, in I that. know. <laughs> so um, can you expand more on the methodology and the percentage difference, and then how that's looking correlating to your test data? Um, so I'm just. Can I go back? Is that all right if I move back? Okay. Um, are you talking about wait a minute, that's that out. one? This one right here? Yeah. Well, yeah, it, you started talking about how. Yeah. yeah, so this, so each of these different lines are different algorithms. And so we call these ARDTs, Atmospheric River Detection Tools. There's too many acronyms. <laughs> but ARDT, so the, uh, detection tool, all it is, is a, it's a bunch of code that basically will define the spatial footprint of an atmospheric river on a grid of data set. Mm -hmm. And so and so different uh, research, research groups will, will care about, um, you know, like a, one, a, one group, uh, I actually have a prepared slide. <laughs> one group, you know, cares more about impacts. And so this is sort of a complicated slide. So let me see if I can put it up here. If not, maybe I just have to move it this way. Sorry, give me a sec. All right, so method one. <laughs> method one cares more about like the intensity. And so these little, the little blur, the little bubbles are a time, a time, a time, a, time, a, a place in time, like a timestamp, right? And this is over the whole course of the model. So like 20 years of data that we're looking at. The, the reds or the oranges are climate change and the blues are historical, right? And so method one, if you like, take a look at how the shape is changing with warming, it, it has actually the, sh the shape not changing too much because this is coverage. So this is like the area. And then the average IBT intensity is on the x-axis. And so 
they're becoming more intense, but the shape isn't changing. Okay, and so, and then method two might care more about um, the impacts per given intensity. So like, so the intensity is sort of the same. They sort of set the intensities, like an atmospheric river needs to be at least 500 kilogram per meter per second. So the kilogram per meter per second is the mass and the, and the speed combined together. So it has to be at least this amount in order to be called an atmospheric river. And so those tend to actually not change much intensity, but they change their shape. Like in the, so in a warming world, that 500 kilogram per meter per square area is just gonna be bigger and blobbier. Um, and so, so but that, the method two people care more about what that spatial coverage is. And method one people care more about maybe, you know, maybe this with the one and keeping the structure the same. And so these are different research questions. And so, and so that's why they develop their tool to detect the atmosphere reverse to answer the question they want to. But the problem with that is that it's really hard to say something collectively about atmospheric rivers and climate change, we have so many different ways of, of defining it. So one of the things that ARTMIP tries to do is to say, you can't just look at one way. You need to look at a, a bunch of ways, you know, and then we can have a range of possibilities. Like the shape can, will be anywhere from here to here, or the amount of, of atmospheric rivers that hits the West Coast will be anywhere from here to here. Maybe expanding in October, <laughs> you know, maybe not, depending on like, you know, what your methodology is. So it's really, it's sort of complicated and it's very subtle, but it's something that absolutely has to be addressed. And we are addressing it in the community right now. In fact, I feel I'm, I'm very positive because like now when I read papers, people are talking about uncertainties and the limitations of when we use one method and you see more people using more than one method to say, okay, well, this is the range of possibilities of what I think will happen but, you know, based on my research question here. So does that answer your question? It does. And how is that looking with actual physical test data versus the, the model? Like, what's the percentage offset? Okay, so for the, the, so this is like another tricky thing in terms of validating atmospheric, the, these yeah. tools. So we validate them using reanalysis data. Uh -huh. And what I mean by reanalysis data, this is actually, it's a gridded data set but it melds observations and models. So it's not pure observation. And so uh, one of the things that ARTMIP does is, is like we have a baseline. Everyone runs their code on our observational product, which is model and OBS, and to have a baseline of what that, you know, what that method does compared to other methods. And then, and then the step two is this is how it changes in climate. The problem is that the observational data set isn't pure observations, right? So when we first started in the ARTMIP program, we actually had a few graduate students, bless them, <laughs> to actually, we had a test period of a month, February of 2017, because I had so many atmospheric rivers, and we had them count by hand, you know, this, like, looking at the satellite pictures and, and data, like, yes, we counted by hand, this is how many observational you know, data sets we have. There are also some of the observational data sets on the West Coast that CW3E uses, but those are for points, not for the whole globe. And so there's this, there's this, you know, uh, fine, this balance we have to dance when we are trying to, we're validating on a product that's actually not pure observations. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. thank you. Great, and our next online question is from Stu, who is wondering if you could comment on short-term atmospheric river forecasting affecting reservoir op operations, uh, in other words, flood pools. I heard this was an issue at Oroville. Yeah, you know, I don't know a lot about that. There is a there is a definitely a lot of people, um, researchers that are looking at short-term uh, forecasting and actually sub what we call sub-seasonal, like one to you know four, one to four weeks or something like that. Um, but I don't, I, that's not, I don't know a lot about it, but I know there are definitely, like the, the Scripps group has a, 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 in that operational center, they actually do pr produce a short-term forecast for that sort of a thing. And they do work with water managers. So if you're a water manager and interested <laughs> in that, I would actually send you to that CW3E website, um, cause they probably have some, some information, but I do, I do know the water managers care, uh, interact with the atmospheric river scientists because, um, you know, just in terms of like uh, planning for the future for like, you know, or like a dam, for example, you know, it's a, to, if they, in the future we need to build up the, the height of the dam, 
is like one thing that is being done in certain dams in California. Another thing is like increasing the integrity of the actual dam structure so there is less, um, you know, with, to be able to see more pressure within the deep within the reservoir. So um, there are definitely things that are being being looked at to address that. But I would send that person um, this person to that website maybe, yeah, for more details. <laughs> Great, and I'll, uh, Patricia has a couple of questions, so I'll probably ask them together okay. uh, step by step. Okay. Um, so first, are you using finite difference modeling? Um, so, okay, I mean, the, the, the um, there's a lot of, there's, there's some follow-up questions I would have. <laughs> the, um, the models that we used for this climate change piece, like, uh, was um, um, the community earth system model, and that does use finite differencing. Um, as a tool for the calculation, if that was the question, um, there are uh, different types of dynamical cores or called ways we actually do the computation in different models. Um, and this one that for for this study that that I showed with the different climate change used the the, um, the finite volume. It's called the finite volume di dynamical core. The one that I showed with Allison McCallis was the, with the Oroville Dam. That one. Uh, use uses an unstructured the, the modeling across scales is something a little bit different. It's a it's called a spectral element um, type of a dy dynamical core. So I'm not really sure if that was your question, but that's my best attempt at answering it. <laughs> and the second part of that question is, what type of computer do you use to uh, solve these equations? Well, we have supercomputers. So um, the one uh, that I, sh the, the, a lot of the CSM actually, the, which is done here at NCAR, um, uses the, our supercomputer uh, in, in, in our facilities. Um, the ArtMIP uh, community use the, the, um, uh, the facilities at um, the Berkeley lab. So uh, they're just like, they could make, they're supercomputers, they like, uh, they can they can handle like billions of calculations in a second. I don't I don't have the stats, so I, that could be completely wrong. Maybe it's millions, maybe it's billions, but it's a very fast machine, <laughs> not a laptop. <laughs> yeah. And, and then part three, how do you deal with nonlinear and chaotic effects? Uh, well, yeah, okay, so that's a hard hard question. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how to interpret this question. So. Um, I mean, because nonlinearity and chaotic, I mean, we're, this, we're just talking sort of about weather, and so I'm just going to boil this down into, you know, weather, a climate is the average weather. And so the, a climate model is different from a weather model. A weather model um, will, uh, it tends to be higher resolution, means higher fidelity, those group points are closer together, and um, it only runs uh, like maybe up to 48 hours or a week or two weeks or something like that. And so there's, when the equations are solved, they're solved, they, we don't have to solve everything because we're only looking at a short period of time. We're not looking at the whole year. So we don't have to care about the whole seasonal cycle. Where climate models are much different, they tend to be coarser in resolution. And then they, we run them for a lot longer and they, there's more stuff we need to calculate because we have to account for the whole, um, the whole, you know, like the whole seasonal cycle, the whole year, uh, which means it, like how the sun changes and moves around the earth, or the earth moves around the sun. <laughs> um, so I'm not, I probably didn't answer her question, but I'm not really sure how to, how else to, to address that. And then the final part of that, uh, of the question is, uh, if there's a website that Patricia can go to to get more technical information on atmospheric modeling. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> you can also feel free to contact me, and then we can have a chat, and then maybe I can understand what you're, what, what the questions you're after. Um, the community earth system model. There's a we have a awesome website, um, and it, we can see, talk about all the little different. You can see the different documentation for the different models, especially for the atmosphere model. CSM also has a tutorial, so if you're a graduate student or a postdoc, um, I would highly encourage, and you care about climate modeling, you should apply to be part of the tutorial. We'll teach you how to run the model, and we'll teach you all sorts of things about what goes in the guts in the model, answer all of these questions better than I did. Oh. So, yeah, so go to the CSM website, yeah. Great. Uh, any uh, in-person questions? 
If not, we'll take uh, a question from Lou, uh, who's asking, what operational forecast services are available to support atmospheric river sensitive decision making? Yeah, so this was the, um, the slide that I, I tried to think about that for you guys. Um, operational centers, so um, yeah, it, it might be in the Slido. It was my last slide, so there's the CW3E is a definitely is an operational center. They do forecasts, they also do reconnaissance missions. Other, um, there's actually a water uh, specific uh, part to the National Weather Service website, so that's water.weather.gov, I think if I'm reading that right. Um, and uh, so for, for, the, for the US. Um, now, other operational centers around the world don't, that I, I, don't I don't particularly know of any that, that do AR specific stuff other than CW3 and the South America one, the, the CR cubed in Chile. Um, but ECMWF does, um, I'm sure there's probably people in, the, in that community that might have a research you know, op research-based operational center. I just don't know about it. So um, the one I do know about is CW3E at Scripps, and so I would definitely go there. It's a great, it's a great, great, been a great website. Yeah. Great. And our last online question is from Stephen. So arguably, subtropical jets pose the greatest challenge in anticipating the atmospheric river behavior. A warmer atmosphere should yield weaker subtropical jets. So how well do models forecast subtropical jets? Um, well, this actually depends on the model. <laughs> you know, there are some models, if you look at the different types of, there's, a, there's an effort called the CMIP, the uh, Climate Model Intercomparison Project, that has all, all, a whole bunch of different um, climate models. And so uh, different climate models will actually have a different uh, representation of what the subtropical jet does. Um, uh, so it's, uh, that, that is a, it's, it's a research question for sure, and it would be something that you need to look across uh, climate models to see how the different jets are, you know, uh, behave across, you know, different instances. Just sort of like I was saying for the art map, we want to look at what uh, atmospheric rivers do across, across a range of possibilities. We do the same thing with climate models. Um, you know, this is what IPCC, the Intergovernment Panel of Climate Change, does. It compares a whole bunch of different um, climate models to try to tell, uh, communicate, you know, with uh, confidence or low confidence what's going to happen in the climate based on the climate model. So um, you can check out the IPCC websites to see the range of, of, of possibilities for different models. Any last in-person questions? Otherwise, I do have one, but I'll see if there's any other ones. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so for our um, undergrad and grad students that might be in the room or watching online who might be interested in doing this type of work, do you have any uh, advice for them? I know you talked about the CES sub workshop. Is um, any other ideas to give them? Um, uh, well, I yeah, I guess um, you know participate in some of the, in, in some of our uh, you know uh, the. The workshop or the tutorials if you're interested in getting into climate modeling um, if you're I, I guess depending on like if you're an undergraduate or a graduate student there's um, you know uh, there's different opportunities for um, uh, van in our advanced studies program here at NCAR to for uh, both graduate students and, and undergrad and, um, and graduate student and uh, postdocs um, I would, yeah, just you know, reach out, <laughs> um, get involved. There's a we have a workshop. The CSN has a workshop uh, that that um, is more about the the modeling piece of it. But um, in terms of atmospheric rivers them, themselves, um, yeah, it's a great, it's it's a fun community. I would, you know, read papers, reach out, talk to people. That's my advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thanks, and we'll give another round of applause for you. Thanks to everybody here in the room. Thanks to everybody online. I also want to just give a shout out to the folks behind the scenes. So to Aaliyah, Paul, Nick, and Brett. Um, thank you so much for supporting this event. Uh, so this is our last event for the 2022 Explorer Series. So stay tuned for our 2023 events. Uh, we'll probably have that information here in the next couple of months. Um, so thanks, thanks everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.